So in the second part, I want to focus on just the example of wine. Below, I'll put a link to this great video by winespectator.com on how to taste a red wine. And the interesting thing is you can find lots of videos and lots of articles and in magazines that will offer you explanations on technical processes that anyone can learn on how to improve your ability to taste wine. And it's interesting because it contradicts this idea that everyone has their own taste and it can't be accounted for and instead suggests taste has to be learned. So I will give you a quick guide on the key things that it talks about. Um, there are three phases to a good wine tasting in the formal sense of it. You have the attack phase. In the attack phase, you might focus on things like alcohol, tannin levels, uh, acidity, residual sugars, and use vocabulary like intense, complex, soft, firm. Um, after the first taste of the wine, you have the evolution phase where you want to focus on more general descriptions like fruit, spice, woody, flavor. Um, and then there's a finish phase, which is the aftertaste. Is it short? Is it long? Um, and what was your impression overall of, the of this last flavor? And by breaking taste into these three stages, you can now make tasting wine a much more complex thing, and you can compare wines in, in, in their great variety. Um, now, one of the interesting things about these tasting guides and these tasting lessons is vocabulary shapes the, the richness of your ability to notice different flavors. So, for example, when you look at the wine, they provide you this, it's just a red wine, but they give you this wide variety of colors, garnet, dark red, light red, ruby red, opaque and purple, to encourage you to look at subtle differences that are due to tannins. Um, They'll want to ask you to pay attention to the label, to know if it's a Bordeaux, a Merlot, and then link that to this full versus light-bodied wine. Um, the types of grapes obviously change the kind of wine. Um, but the interesting experiment, if you can try a wine tasting, I encourage you to do it in your home, is if you, instead of thinking of it tasting like red wine, and start to think about what other flavors are mixing in there, you'll start to notice that with the vocabulary they offer you of citrus, blackberry, uh, oak, um, strawberry, and licorice, really trains you to pay attention to more subtle um, descriptions and makes you conscious of them. And then in many cases where before you might not have tasted them, now you suddenly taste them. Now, the industry around, uh, around advice on how to taste wine is big. And perhaps the most famous person is, is Robert Parker, Bob Parker, who uh, has a, a magazine where he gives a 10 point, a 100 point rating system in the, in the 100 point rating system for every wine he tries. They get a score. It has been incredibly successful in the United States and incredibly controversial in the wine world. Um, there is a documentary called Mondovino, and in Mondovino they argue that Rob Parker and these tastemakers, their influence on the American market has started creating pressure on more traditional winemakers to conform to particular standards of taste and standards that aren't necessarily traditional. Um, so Bob Parker is famous for liking oaked wines. Um, oaked wines tend to hide the youth of a, of a red wine. And so one of the criticisms is that he's favoring new producers who create young, cheaper wines instead of the older, more charactered wines. His use of a 100 points uh, rating system is also interesting because it is kind of arbitrary. Why 100 points? Um, the more traditional scoring system before was on a 20 point scale. So one of the questions is why is this 100 point scale more successful? I think part of the answer is for people who are used to a 100 point scale grading system, it's intuitive. It works on our ideas of percent. But obviously a wine that moves from 96 to 95, um, the difference is pretty arbitrary. Even comparing wines below 70, does that mean they are a fail? Um, so he transforms qualitative taste questions into this quantitative language that is on the one hand very attractive, but on the other hand um, unclear about why this is better. Now he is aware of this, which is why he puts in a proviso on his website saying, that scores do not reveal important facts about a wine. Um, you need to have the written accompaniment uh, that describes why they gave the score it did. 
Um, and then, which is common in, in marketing in general, there's always this, this um, tossing the ball back to the consumer, that you need yourself to gain a better education and trust your own taste. We're giving you lots of advice about this, but we're only nudging you. We're not telling you what you should think. Now, his critics have been pro the proponents of terroir. Um, in the documentary Mondovino, they interview people in France, but uh, in much of Europe, the complaint has been that wine is about place and tradition. And terroir is a French word that embodies this, this concept that it is the complete natural environment in which a, f a food or a wi wine or drink is made that shapes its, its character. So the soil, the topography, the climate, the, the proponents in France would argue as well, the traditions of how the local winemaker produces it, um, the traditions of whether it's oaked or not, all sort of become infused into the essence of the wine in a way that can't be scaled up and can't be simplified into a numerical score. So returning to my discussion several weeks ago in industrial versus authentic foods here. In the terroir system, authentic equals locality as a referent. Authentic champagne is champagne from Champagne, France. Authentic cava is cava from the uh, Catalan region, Benedes, uh, that produces cava. And anyone who produce, attempts to produce this in other localities um, is just making a cheap imitation or, rec or replica and it's not authentic. This shows up in the marketing of wine in an important place. Uh, more than most any other product, wines labels are about place. Uh, the World Trade Organization accepted the dispute, accepted the European position uh, over a decade ago and the dispute between, on the one hand, Argentina and the United States, new wine producers, and on the other side, France and other European countries, old wine producers. And the World Trade Organization agreed with France and other countries in saying that denomination of origin is meaningful and that the French have a right to protect their label as a kind of region-based brand. Um, and so Argentina can't make a champagne, the United States can't make a Bordeaux or a Bordeaux-style wine. These are something that belong to their place. Um, and so on labels, you'll see this very complicated system, particularly in Europe, in Europe that have uh, the breakdown of appellation d'origine controls that can talk about um, Vin de Table, where it's generic, Vin de Pain, which is from a region, and then this AOC, which is the very specific controls on place, but also process. But the wine industry innovates. Um, in some ways, you can think of wine as ha suffering the same problems of marketing that other drinks, beverages like Coca-Cola suffer, and trying to incorporate new technologies. So one, there are many debates in the wine industry over what kinds of traditions must be kept and what kinds of innovations should be used to improve the sale and, and the distribution of wine. And to cork or not to cork is one of these debates. Um, for uh, over a decade now, new wine growers have been saying, we don't need to use cork, we can use plastic cork. And it has advantages. Cork wines often spoil because of um, either some kind of contamination or the possibility of air getting in. And this is something that can be avoided now with industrial wine producing and the use of plastic. The argument has been made that plastic is cheaper, um, even better screw tops don't require the complicated process of opening, and the new wine producers say that we don't need the other wine, this is kind of mysticism on the cork. Now, having lived in Spain, I would like to add that uh, there is a kind of irony in these movements of pushing plastic over cork. The, earlier, the, the plastic cork industry argued that cork was using trees and this was uh, unenvironmentally, but in fact, the opposite is true. Cork trees are one of the few renewable resources. And so as this article discusses, as cork production has been less commonly used, cork forests are disappearing and they're an important habitat for lynx. Um, so I ironically, it's more ecological in many ways to use cork than to use plastic tops or screw tops. And another debate in wine is whether the wine has to be served in bottles. Traditionally, boxed wine is understood to be wine for poor people. Poor people who, um, or even worse, the homeless, 
um, who have no standards about good wine drinking and just simply are using it to get drunk. Um, but in the last 10 years, uh, some producers have seen it as an opportunity. Um, in this photo, you can see two, two containers compared and the box wine is argued to be more ecological because it's 96% weight wine and only 4% package weight, uh, which means that it's when it's shipped around, you're shipping more wine at a, at a better cost and therefore better an ecological cost compared to the bottle. And with new packaging principles, you can preserve the flavor of the wine just as effectively in a bottle. So to wrap up, you have these two drinks that I mentioned in the last thing, Coca-Cola and wine. Um, they nicely illustrate two, a division in marketing strategies. On the one hand, mass marketing. On the other hand, niche marketing and marketing targeted along class. Is this going to be a populist drink? Can wine be drunk by anyone? Or is it something that is for an elite or sophisticated person? Whereas Coca-Cola is about everyone having um, this drink. Now this leads to certain restraints. On the one hand, with wine, uh, it has been struggling to try to reach a new market that doesn't see itself as pretentious. And so trying to market wine as something that's not pretentious, but available to everyone, um, has been a challenge in that industry. Coca-Cola, on the other hand, has been limited on how much it can diversify its product line. Y you can see in this image a green can for Coca-Cola Life product. This was not a successful product. It was intended to be a low calorie drink and the green was kind of play with a new kind of iconic image, um, but consumers didn't like it. And there's a famous failed experiment in Coca-Cola where they sell uh, a blue can. And apparently the reason why the customers on taste test didn't like it is because they thought that Coca-Cola had changed the recipe. Part of the psychology of tasting Coca-Cola was the recognition of the red and that by changing the color of the can, suddenly people tasted it differently.